So I think you can start uh, now. We have 50 people join us today in this workshop. So hello, everyone. Uh, good morning for those who are from good morning, good afternoon, in case you have read, uh, had lunch today. So depending on where you are. So many thanks for joining us in this Ocean Best Practice workshop number seven. We will, during the whole week, explore the 10 ocean decade challenges and the ways that the ocean best practice can then support these common and successful solutions for a more collective and meaningful impact. I'm Paula. I'm oceanographer working at Plus Atlantic Collab. We are here based in the sunny city of Lisbon, Portugal. And I'm very glad to moderate this session dedicated to our uh, the seven ocean decade challenge, which is how we are going to expand the global ocean observing system. Uh, so our goal today here is to share activities around the globe. You, you have the opportunity to hear four very nice presentations, which are locally and some of them regionally establishing and implementing best practice for ocean observations and as well seeking community support and validation for this discussion. So we are going to have, as I had said, four presentations, each one lasting 15 minutes, each one. And then in the end, we have an open discussions of 15, 20 minutes. You can put your questions in the questions and answers, the Q&A tool you have here in Zoom. Uh, also in the YouTube, if you are uh, uh, watching the YouTube streaming, uh, so I'm very happy to welcome our first uh, speaker of today. You're going to have four. Our first one is Joaquin Tintore. Joaquin is from the Balearic Island Coastal Observing System, our first speaker. So Joaquin, if you want to start, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for accepting to be here today with us. Okay, thank you very, very much. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's a real pleasure really to be, to be here. And in the next uh, 10 minutes, I want to try to show to you some examples of how regional seas observing systems, and when I talk about observing, I of course mention, mean observing and predicting, uh, but how they are contributing to both, <clears throat> excuse me, the global ocean observing system, but also how through some uh, applications and, uh, and uh, impacts, we are contributing towards uh, regional digital twins. Um, so my outline is this one. Uh, first, um, the dimension of the regional ocean observing systems, the singularities of those systems, and how we are trying to put together uh, the different pieces of an n-dimensional puzzle. Uh, the second uh, part of my presentation will be related to some examples of SOCIBA and ocean best practices, and how we are trying to contribute uh, um, through those best practices to open science and to uh, reliable uh, procedures that uh, will uh, drive me to the final elements of uh, applications and solutions um, related to the digital twin of the ocean and the need for transformative changes. Uh, so thanks very much. So I'll start with SOCIB. What SOCIB is? SOCIB stands for the Balearic Islands Coastal Observing System. And what SOCIB is, is a research infrastructure and it's a multi-platform ocean observing and forecasting system that goes from the near shore and the beaches to the open sea and with uh, observing from events to climate. At SOCIB, we have three major drivers responding to science priorities, uh, enhancing technology development and responding to society needs. And we provide free open data and products and services for science and for society. Our approach is collaborative uh, research infrastructure. And uh, uh, here, what you see is uh, the different elements uh, of uh, SOCIB observing uh, capacities, gliders, research vessel, profilers, surface drifting buoys, marine animal tracking, moorings, tide gauges, HF radar, and beach monitoring. And what we do is we combine all those elements and what we try is to integrate all those elements towards uh, specific uh, mission-oriented goals. Just to give you an example uh, on gliders, in our 10 years of operations, we have been able to run more than 20, 200 missions, 95,000 profiles 
and our gliders have run, uh, have navigated 120,000 kilometers. So that's three times uh, around the equator in our planet. Um, the next slide shows you the integrated approach uh, from SOSIB, uh, from ocean observation on the right to including all those data in our predicting models uh, and then responding to society needs. A key element in this slide is data reliability, data reliability and data quality uh, in relation to fair data and trustable data repositories. Those are essential elements. And here is what we do in terms of uh, SOSIB data management framework. Uh, what you see here on the left is the different observing facilities. Those facilities provide process uh, real-time data to our forecasting facilities and responding to society needs. And our data center team, uh, what is doing through a data management system is providing curated data and uh, uh, inserting them into our data repository. What I think is important is that um, data reliability and fair data are nowadays a prerequisite for really innovation and by innovation, I mean real science and also applications in responding to society needs. Um, our SOSIB data repository has uh, three major uh, uh, elements and user interfaces to support different uh, use cases. We have operational data through our threat server. Um, we have a detailed data catalog, which is more related to our and users uh, providing operational data uh, and uh, DOIs, and then uh, our API for machine-to-machine -machine, uh, interface. Um, one clear element uh, of uh, the data I have already mentioned is data reliability. And for these uh, data have to be fair. We all talk about fair data, but we don't really uh, 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 we do not really show normally how fair our data are. And um, in here today, I will just uh, like to insist that we have to find a way together to really uh, reach fair data, fair by construction. It is too difficult or it is very difficult to have fair data uh, if this has not been fair from the beginning. So I think we have to go forward and to move towards fair data by construction from the very the very beginning. In our case, what we did is to really move towards uh, the core trust seal of excellence and um, through a, a, a lot of work uh, from our data team, we succeeded on this. And this is just a, a step forward in our, uh, our long-term goal. So that's the SOSIB data repository. It's open access. It's fair and uh, trustable. And what I think is uh, very relevant is that uh, the associated data repository is linked to the European uh, key portals, both Copernicus Marine Service and Emodnet. It's directly related to Blue Cloud also and the European Science Cloud. And it's responding to major EU challenges nowadays, like the European Digital Twin of the Ocean and Destination Earth. And one additional element here on the right is that through this uh, approach at SOSIB, we are really contributing to the different elements of open science. And open science, as you see in this slide, is really much more than open data. It's really something much bigger and wider. And um, now let me just switch towards uh, really uh, showing to you some example of, of ocean best practices, uh, focusing on two of the platforms that uh, we have uh, more um, uh, advanced maybe, if I can say, uh, at SOSIB. That's the HF radar and the gliders. And um, in terms of uh, common procedure for HF radar QC analysis, quality control analysis, what I can say is that in relation to near real-time observations, but also in relation to delayed mode in situ observations for HF radar, SOSIB has actively contributed to the definition and implementation of best practices of different type of platforms in the context of uh, different EU projects. And by this, in, through this, uh, what we have uh, uh, developed is a number of uh, HF radar pro data products and a number of quality control tests uh, 
uh, that were selected from the quartered manual and that are now mandatory. So uh, additionally, and uh, in general, so SIP contributions are now available in the Ocean Best Practices repository. And you can see that there are already now 48 results um, labeled with SOSIP tag. So we are slowly advancing and providing our inputs to the Ocean Best Practices system. Very quickly, some other quick examples, guidelines for HF radar data ingestion. Um, I will not provide uh, details. The presentation will be here and I'm available for later uh, questions by mail. SOSIP has led the development of guidelines for facilitating the implementation and synchronization of the data with the European HF radar network from data ingestion to the European HF radar uh, node. And you have here the, uh, the major elements from the antennas um, in situ to the threats uh, HF radar mode. Uh, another key element have been the HF radar best practices for deployment and operation uh, during all the data life cycle. We had a very relevant Jericho deliverable and uh, a paper you know, published in Frontiers. And those two documents provide, I think, really very nicely a, a best practices document to ensure a broader approach to optimal operation of the HF radar system with independence from the manufacturer or antenna design and setup. So it's uh, really a, a nice example of best practice for deployment and um, an operation. And you have here the, the schematic of this, um, of this approach. Uh, another key element in here is the homogenization of tools. Uh, and here, what we have done is really uh, following some of the international leadership, um, in this case from Rutgers, we have really developed HORT, which is, stands for HF Radar Online Outgauge Reporting Tool, which is a functional homogenization tool um, for implementation of a web-based application uh, to aid operations and maintenance uh, uh, of all the uh, HF Radar elements. And um, uh, we like to talk to mention DAR, that is the acronym for detect, alert, and report, and that's what uh, what this is. Uh, this tool is is providing us and all the all the operators. Um, similarly to this, in terms of homogenization tool, the development of a HR radar ne network uh, node, the RESTful API, and another RESTful API. So APIs are really being used. Uh, uh, for other parties, other parties and applications and um, metadata are being really um, displayed and being used. And all this helps in computing the different uh, KPIs. Uh, data management plans. The data management plans are essential to improve day-to-day -day handling of research uh, data, and they create a, a, a more collaborative and sustainable system. And this is the workflow of our HF radar data management plan, which is at the base of uh, all the best practices that I have just uh, mentioned. Some quick examples from uh, glider operations, in this case, uh, related to salinity standard operational procedures from the pre deployment operational phase during the mission and post uh, deployment. And we are slowly advancing on this uh, along this road. Uh, similarly, in, in this case for oxygen, um, and uh, uh, similarly the three the three phases. And uh, what we mm -hmm. pretend with all this is, of course, to improve data quality and reliability, and contributing to uh, ocean best practices. All this leads to uh, present and finalize. Uh, really mentioning the mission-driven innovation strategies uh, and digital twin capacities at SOSIB. SOSIB, after 10 years of work, is providing nowadays data, resources, knowledge, and advice to 10 sectors of society that you have here indicated from marine and coastal operations, marine safety, marine sports, etc. And uh, through this scientific excellence, but also with impact on society approach, what SOSIP has been developing is a number of decision support tools or applications in relation to uh, beach safety or sustainable fisheries or meteor tsunami early warning or marine heatways uh, tools. 
So I think here, the bottom line is that we have really advanced from science to society, and all this uh, provides a very solid base for the digital twins. Um, uh, but there's a big but on this approach, um, and uh, it's that um, following UN Ocean Decade, we believe the associate that we need a real transformation in ocean observing, and we need a real change towards ocean integration for enhanced science and responding to society challenge. And this is um, what we try to mimic following what is done in uh, music uh, with the diversity in the orchestra to be combined with the common elements, but really it's the harmony on top of the different components. And we have to evolve from ego systems to ecosystems with um, ocean optimism, which I think is an essential component. What we have done uh, through this in the frame of the Eurosea project is to start an ocean integration work calling for a transformative uh, organizational changes along three major lines, building a collective impact organization, reaching sustainability, and promoting a cultural shift. And this is my last slide. In summary, I think it's the right time for the ocean and for ocean best practices and digital twins. There are some changes in science, technology, and society. Uh, regional observing systems because of their critical mass, mission-oriented innovation, and society engagement activities are key elements and provide, as indicated here, symbiotic ecosystems that allow scientific excellence with impact. And uh, to finalize, uh, I am convinced that the ocean best practices system is supporting really right now already and very efficiently the development of common solutions that are fully aligned with the digital twins frameworks, but we still need integration. And for this integration, we're going to need leadership and transformation. And I thank you very, very much. This is also SIP team contributing to all the work and those are SIP partners also contributing all of it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joaquin. It was very great. Thank you also for uh, keeping on time. Uh, I think I'll be with this phrase uh, with a long time in my my head from ecosystem to ecosystem that it's I think it's a very uh, good way to think and you know, how to integrate more things and I, I think a key message also from your presentation is the importance of having this fair data since the beginning and then you this you for sure ensure us to have this integration in the future not only in this already existing platforms, these open source platforms, but the other ones that are going to you know to appear uh, to cover all this ocean, digital twins of the ocean. So very nice presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, Joaquin, you'll be not with us until the end. So if you have any uh, questions we, uh, for him, you can put, uh, you can add the in this Q&A uh, tool. And then he can also uh, answer um, by email or in other ways for you. So thank you very much, Joaquin. And then I'm glad to invite Johanna. So Johanna Karagali, Johanna, thank you, Johanna. Johanna is from the Danish Meteorologic Institute. Uh, and Johanna, you'll be here with us as well. So thank you very much for accepting this presentation. Yes, you're already uh, sharing, I can see. Mm -hmm. So the floor is yours, thank you very much. Hi, Paula, thanks for having me. Thank you all for attending the seminar. Uh, I have been uh, tasked uh, to give a presentation about the operational sea surface temperature data retrieved from satellites. And uh, I am representing the Danish Meteorological Institute along another a long list of co-authors from the same institute. Uh, we have Anno Carol uh, from UMETSAT uh, as a co-author, who is also the chair of the GRIST science team. And for those of you who don't know what GRIST is, it's the group for high resolution sea surface temperature. It's an international uh, group of experts and data producers uh, that have for the last uh, 24 years been meeting and collaborating into creating um, a system where a satellite retrieved SST can be processed uh, from, uh, from the basic uh, information to a final product delivered to users and have a consistent format throughout all the available products so that users can always 
um, know what to expect when they download and process some uh, sea surface temperature data. So with this presentation, I will try to give you an overview of why sea surface temperature is important and especially from satellites. So as probably you all know, uh, global and regional temperature continues to rise. And especially for the SST, uh, um, it's crucial for understanding, monitoring and modeling the climate. Satellites can provide uh, a very wide view of SST from space. Uh, operating in different channels of the electromagnetic spectrum. I will say a few things about that later on. But essentially, uh, what the group for uh, high resolution sea surface temperature, GRIST, aims to do is to coordinate the provision of satellite derived global SST with uh, good estimates of the uncertainty for the SST retrieval. Uh, and it's uh, aimed to operational users for climate, ocean monitoring, prediction um, purposes, but also the science community. On the last part of this slide, you can see a link which can take you to the GRIS product catalog, where uh, one can find an overview of the available SST products from space, uh, either in their original single sensor format or uh, processed as a uh, uh, gap-free uh, level four products. So we are basing uh, SST from space on a virtual constellation of uh, sensors that span from the uh, passive microwave part of the spectrum to the infrared uh, part of the spectrum. And these two types of sensors have uh, complementary um, information because uh, Infrared radiometers uh, can provide very high resolution but cannot penetrate clouds, while microwave radiometers can penetrate clouds, so they can see, let's say, under clouds, but they have a coarser spatial resolution. And on top of that, uh, we also have the sensors that are on a geostationary orbit that provide very frequent observations, but of the same area all the time. To complement our SST space-based retrievals, we also have a, a large network of fiducial reference measurements, so in situ measurements of very good quality that are used for validating the satellite products and also for ensuring quality, consistency and traceability. Uh, one may ask why satellite SST important. So uh, the main reasons uh, have to do with the fact that uh, Retrievals from space allows us to cover a large uh, part of the global ocean every day. And uh, SST is very important because uh, it uh, plays a big role in climate mod monitoring, modeling, and for seasonal predictions, as it has been shown that it can improve the seasonal predictions. It, of course, uh, influences the atmospheric circulation. It acts as a boundary layer for weather forecasting and uh, it has a direct link to oceanography uh, as it influences the density and circulation of the oceans. And of course, it impacts the biogeochemistry and marine ecosystems. One of the important things to mention is that SST is not one thing. And uh, that can be somehow um, schematically shown in the figure on the top right of this slide, where you can see that um, uh, sea surface temperature depends a lot on the depth or the reference depth, and that is different depending on the instrument uh, observe, observing the SST. So we have the SST interface, so that's the gray star on the very top of the ocean surface, which is essentially not measure, not measurable. We have what we call SST skin, so that is a few microns below the surface, and it's typically observed through infrared radiometers. We have SST subskin, that is uh, the temperature uh, in the bottom of the first millimeter that is typically observed by uh, passive microwave instruments. And then we have SST at a certain depth uh, that is either a half a meter, a meter, 10 meters, depending on, on the measurement. And, and what this figure shows in a very nice way is that uh, these uh, SST definitions can change depending on the conditions. So if you look on the red line, which is almost vertical, uh, it shows the difference of various SST definitions 
during nighttime or when the conditions are well mixed, so under strong winds. So there's a very uh, good uh, mixing of the upper uh, layer of the ocean and the temperature is more or less uniform. But what the right uh, side of the figure shows, so this uh, black uh, curved line, is that during daytime when there's uh, little to no wind and there's strong solar heating, the upper few meters of the ocean can warm up significantly compared to the depths below. So retrievals from different sensors can actually give us quite a different uh, SST. What is for sure uh, the case is that uh, global average SSTs have, uh, have increased, as you can see from this schematic uh, from the UK Met Office that shows uh, the average uh, difference based on the climatology from the pre-industrial uh, levels. And this is, of course, a very worrying sign, so it's uh, important that we keep on uh, monitoring uh, SST. Uh, our uh, Space-based uh, SST retrievals can allow us uh, for a consistent uh, monitoring of SST from the beginning of the 80s, where more or less the satellite era began. And uh, the, we can have um, estimation of, for example, the SST annual anomalies, as you can see on the left side of this uh, slide where we see uh, yearly from 1982 up to 2016 in this case, what uh, has been the difference in uh, mean SST based on a climatology. This is by the way from a paper by Merchant et al published in 2019. And uh, what uh, another thing that we can actually use our uh, global SST products for is to actually understand what uh, the climate signal is based, for example, on a reference time series from the HAD SST, and that's the black line going back from the uh, 1800s. And then uh, we can have all the colored lines towards the end of the, of the 20th century. So in the beginning of the 1980s onwards, we have uh, the mean SSTs from our different satellite products compared to the reference SST. And we see that we are actually towards uh, the 2020s, we are doing very well in actually representing this, uh, the time series, uh, the reference SSTs. Other applications of sea surface temperature involve marine heat waves, as you can see from the left side of this slide, as an example from the Mediterranean Sea, it's a publication by Pisano et al, showing a warming trend of uh, 0.041 degrees per year that uh, actually um, translates into a one and a half degree warming uh, for the period 1982 to 2008 when actually this uh, analysis was made. Um, SST is also very relevant for coral heat stress. And uh, there is an example on the right side of this slide uh, from uh, Skirfing et al. from 2020 on uh, how SST can be used to assess coral heat stress and, um, and, uh, and monitoring it. Uh, another area of uh, very important, uh, of high importance for, uh, for uh, SST and high surface temperature as well is the Arctic. And uh, we now have uh, both sea surface temperature and nice surface temperature products uh, that uh, allow an, uh, the monitoring of the Arctic. And by Arctic, uh, we mean the Arctic Ocean above 60 degrees uh, latitude. And uh, from the time series on the right hand side, uh, from a publication by Nielsen uh, Englis et al. from uh, 2023, uh, we can see that there is a four degree increase in the Arctic uh, Ocean surface temperature from the period uh, 1982 and uh, up to 2021. A main challenge for uh, this kind of monitoring is the lack of in situ data. It's very hard to have data in the Arctic. And actually uh, another challenge relates to the accurate identification of uh, sea ice and understanding what is open water and what is sea ice uh, covered water. So in this case, there's also a need associated to this challenge and it's the improvement of the passive microwave data availability in the Arctic, because as I mentioned earlier, uh, passive microwave data are uh, able to actually penetrate uh, through clouds and we have observations under cloudy conditions where that's very typical in the Arctic. Uh, more challenges for improving sea surface temperature relate to the coastal SST data quality. As you know, the best sensors we have right now are in the order of uh, one kilometer spatial resolution, but for the coastal ecosystems and coastal areas, we need uh, high resolution um, observations. 
and uh, there are some major challenges uh, associated uh, with uh, this area because uh, coastal areas have greater uh, variability in the water vapor and that's important for our SSD retrieval. Also greater variability of the temperature and aerosols and that also affects a lot the ways we retrieve SSD from space. And also, they are very complex systems with changes in surface emissivity and turbidity, but also in, 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 in clouds. So there is a need here that's associated with uh, higher spatial resolution satellite data from multiple sources. And there are a few upcoming missions that will allow higher spatial resolution data uh, for the coastal regions. But the obvious message here is that we need more and continuous um, missions in the future. Another major challenge is uh, how we monitor, understand, and improve the feature resolution of the sea surface temperature. And by feature resolution, it's meant uh, uh, the eddies or the gradients, the abrupt changes uh, in SSD. And the main challenge here uh, relates to the reliance of, uh, on high resolution infrared data, which of course are limited by cloud cover. And there's an obvious need for focusing on new techniques, uh, for example, in coastal waters and upwelling systems, polar and dynamic regions. And this of course uh, links a lot to the previous uh, challenge about coastal uh, SSD data quality. The GRIST uh, group, uh, meets once per year uh, in an uh, international uh, science team meeting where uh, we discuss uh, many of these topics and we come up with priorities for the next decade, some of which uh, have already been mentioned uh, and they involve the Arctic and high latitudes for the obvious reasons of intense warming that we are observing there. And as mentioned before, the coastal data quality and the SST feature resolution. Some of the observational needs of, uh, for the sea surface temperature from satellites have been actually summarized into a white paper and published uh, during the Ocean Ops uh, 2019 uh, meeting. And uh, they, can, uh, they can essentially be uh, shortened to a need for a continuity and redundancy of the satellite-based constellation. Uh, then uh, we need a new generation of geostationary and polar orbiting sensor, which has already started to be built, but innovation to translate this uh, to higher resolution and better accuracy products is still needed. And of course, uh, we need to continuously invest into fiducial reference measurements with known uncertainties, so we are able to validate our uh, satellite SST retrievals. And with that, I'd like to provide some key take-home messages uh, related to the to SST. It's uh, essential for operational meteorology, oceanography, and for seasonal predictions. And uh, it's obviously crucial for climate monitoring, modeling, and, and predictions. We identify and stress out a need for continuity and redundancy of the constellation for satellite SST. And of course, uh, there is a need to maintain and improve our reference in situ measurements to be able to validate the SST retrievals from space. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, yeah, I don't know when it's best to take questions now or later on. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we're going to leave the questions for the end, for the open discussion, as I don't have any questions so far, but you can open the floor for the questions in the end. So thank you very much for the presentation. I think I think you have this unbelievable warm, warm summer. You no, know, this is 2023. I think at least one or two uh, news every week in the, every encounter about talking about marine heat waves. And uh, I'm very glad that you have this group. Uh, I didn't know about this, but I'm very glad to have this. I'm looking for how to are going to improve the measures of those data. And, and then that's it. Thank you very much. And I can now call uh, Kivame Ajekum uh, from Ghana. He can explain, but he is a professor, a lecturer in Earth Observations uh, and a scientist at the University of Ghana and also project coordination of the global monitoring for environment and security. So thank you very much uh, to be here with us, Kivame, and the floor is yours. You have 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Hi, I hope you can hear me and you yes, can see my you screen. Can, and I can see your presentation. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, 
good day everyone and i'm happy to be here um so i will be talking up on a project we have run at the university of ghana uh, where we support countries in north and west africa on and how to utilize earth observation data in coastal and fisheries resource management um so um yes so um we don't do this alone at the university of ghana we work with other partners in in eight countries um egypt uh, morocco um senegal um uh, tunisia uh, ivory coast and um Benin and Nigeria. So um, there are, we have partners who have different expertise who support in what we do. Um, the project is has the acronym MACNOA uh, and it stands for Marine and Coastal Areas Management in North and West Africa. So what exactly do we do and why do we do this? Um, within the context of the GMS and Africa project, um, we are supposed to provide some support to help ensure that we can make the best out of the ocean. We all know the benef benefits of the ocean. I mean, it's it's a place to find fish, uh, coastal systems and uh, water bodies also are areas where we can have aquaculture facilities. Um, the ocean is a, an area for transport. Uh, we can also have energy uh, from uh, the ocean and so forth. So the point I want to make is that the ocean is vast and it's very useful in terms of providing us what we need to be able to survive. And it's important we have strategies to ensure that uh, we use the resources in there wisely. Uh, we can make the best out of it and so forth. So, um, but then how do we do this? Um, um, for, for us within this project, uh, we have some basic mandate. Basically, how do we generate information and tools that will allow if proper management of marine and coastal resources in West and North Africa? So we focus largely in North and West Africa, where we look at the coast, uh, 18 coastal countries, right from Egypt up to Nigeria. And our core objectives are to ensure that there is access to earth observation data, geospatial data, uh, and uh, we also provide that platform that would allow um, countries, uh, institutions within uh, our, our region to be able to utilize those uh, earth observation data and services that we generate. Uh, we have to do this within the context of the African Union space uh, policy and strategy. So at the end of the day, there is there is there is a there is a focus that is how do we slowly get countries to understand the relevance the the usefulness of satellite data in managing resources at the end of the day we have to help them in decision making so generate products that can help them know when it's okay to 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 fish uh, where uh, illegal fishing will be happening and so forth so i'm going to show you a, a, some examples on how um Collecting information within the ocean would would help improve our economies, uh, ensure their safety at sea, um, improve livelihoods of people, and so forth. So um, we do all of this through products that we assess largely from Copernicus. So there's the Copernicus suite of satellites from Sentinel One, Two, Three. Uh, we utilize these uh, data sets. But that's not just that. We 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 can also rely on NOAA uh, uh, suite of satellites. Um, we also uh, rely largely on Mercator products, uh, model products to generate some of our services. So one one of the examples, one of the services that we generate is um, a potential fishing zone map. Uh, it basically uh, we utilize Mercator products to find optimal regions of the ocean where it is likely uh, to find fish because that is where fishing vessels especially the industrial fishing ve vessels that can take so much would go to operate now the idea behind this service is that uh, we have um, a depleted marine resource um, there are lo there's a lot of iu issues within the gulf of guinea and in west africa then how do you provide information for fisheries managers, for the Navy, the, the Coast Guards, to know where to um, concentrate effort in terms of policing the ocean. So this service we generate and we don't make it available to fishermen. No, we rather would send it to the Navy, tell them uh, or to have a fair idea which part of, of 
which part of the ocean within their EEZ, EEZ needs a lot of attention. Uh, we also work with a lot of um, satellite AIS data. So I had indicated that, yes, I use a problem in West Africa. Uh, we need to know where in fishing infractions occur. So we have access to large uh, volumes of data from uh, industrial boats fitted with transponders. Uh, we can track their movement. We have resources to uh, develop scripts that or algorithms that can detect IU fishing uh, activities. One example here uh, is transshipment where fishing vessels meet together at sea. Ideally, uh, you only have to do that when you have you have the right uh, authorization, but sometimes they do not. They meet up, transfer uh, fish from one vessel to the other, which is not good for, for auditing, sort of knowing who is catching what and uh, are, are you using the right uh, fishing implement and so forth. So it's something we need to keep an eye on. And we, we use satellite information from um, vessel traffic to identify some of these infractions. Then we also um, use uh, earth observation data, sea surface temperature, like uh, Joanna had shown, um, uh, ocean color products uh, and other uh, uh, satellite data sets to look at ocean processes that drive fish distribution. So it's important to know how well your upwelling is doing, which time of the year is the upwelling very strong? Has your upwelling shifted? All of these tend to affect uh, where fishes would aggregate. Uh, it, it's important that um, in managing your resource, you know how the ocean affects the changes in abundance and satellite data can provide that. Again, we also have in West Africa and in most developing countries, artisanal fisheries, is, it's very, very important. There are a lot of fishing uh, uh, landing sites in West and North Africa. Um, most of these fishermen do not use those huge motorized boats uh, or, uh, or vessels. They have very, very sort of frail and weak uh, canoes, wooden canoes, and which can take between 10 to about 25 people. Uh, it's only powered by an outboard motor. And the, the waves in here are very rough. So these guys set out just to make ends meet, go find fish, but they are left at the mercy of the weather. And, and and the ocean. So how do we sort of provide information on, on when it's safe to go to sea? Now, one product that we found so useful is um, some insect products on waves and uh, mechanical products. Now, our ability to look at um, the conditions from, from models sort of allow us to provide information to the fishermen, whether it is it's okay to go to sea. And how do we do this? We generate indices that tends to tell us, are the waves too strong? Are the waves okay? Or is it, or do we have intermediate wave strengths? Now, this we share with fishermen either uh, via an app or, a, or a, a USSD, SMS text. But in, in most developing countries, um, sometimes some of these fishermen cannot read and write. So we have an, we found an innovative way of doing this. We tend to use flags. So one, we set out, educated them on the service, uh, explained to them the idea behind the service, show them the apps and the USSD service so that they could assess them. Now, when they are able to assess this information, they are able to know whether it's safe to go to sea or not. And when they cannot read or write, we identify someone in the community who is able to read write and understand the, the, the information we generate. And he communicates this to them using the flags. So um, each day, one of the flags is hoisted at the, at, the, at the landing site, where it tends to tell the fishermen, green, it's safe to go to sea. Uh, yellow, it's intermediate. Uh, it's not too safe. And red, it's terribly rough, so do not go. And this has been very useful, especially in Ghana, Guinea, and, and Togo, where these services run, because it helps save lives. Um, there are examples to show that um, through this service, um, there's been significant reduction in deaths at sea. 
We also have an oil spill monitoring service uh, where we can detect uh, oil spills using radar images from uh, largely from Sentinel-1. Um, this service runs largely in, uh, in North Africa and, and and very soon we will have one running for the West uh, for the West African region. It's going to be fully automatic. Um, the processing time for processing an image could just be about two minutes to about five minutes. I mean, when we process some of these images from uh, Snap, those of you know who knows about Snap, it's a Snap. It could take about let's say 20, 15 to 20 minutes. But the processing time is very fast with the new approaches that we are coming. It's going to be a web application, so it will be easily uh, accessible anywhere around around the world. Uh, we also uh, coming up with services that will allow us to detect ships from radar images. Uh, this will improve uh, maritime security. When we fuse this with AIS data that we receive, we would have better intelligence within our ocean space. Um, let's also not forget that the Gulf of Guinea has a lot of pirate activities. So uh, this service will sort of be useful for our Navy and Coast Guard to ensure that we remain safe. Um, there is also um, the use of satellites to look at um, um, coastal er erosion, shoreline changes, and we are able to generate indices that tells us which parts of our, uh, our coastlines are very, very vulnerable. I mean, there are a lot of assets that we have dotted around the coast, and it's important we have uh, some service that sort of indicates where we need to uh, concentrate uh, in terms of we, we, in, in, like sea defense structures and so forth. Now, um, with regards to f fishing, um, it, I'm, I'm excited showing this because um, largely small fishing boats are not supposed to be electronically monitored. But um, thanks to our project, we've done a, a few demo projects where we are able to monitor small fishing vessels using a uh, class B transponder. So in this example on my right, uh, there is this white um, device you see attached to a, a, a small mast. It's it's a class B transponder that is solar powered. When it's configured uh, with the right information about the vessel, we can detect with satellite anywhere around the world where this vessel is. Now, how useful this is this? This allows us to know where small fishing vessels fish. Owners of vessels now know where the vessels are, what time they are returning. It helps them to, to find market for their fish. Uh, the benefits are, are enormous. Again, we can now include small vessels in any uh, electronic monitoring uh, plan, which is very, very useful. You know, at the end of the day, it's not just the industrial boats or the bigger vessels that we are we are able to look at. We can look at smaller vessels using te this technology. Um, over the years, we've also been excited about taking collecting in situ data. Uh, again, Joanna showed how uh, poorly sat satellites sometimes resolve coastal systems. Now, if we have a lot of in situ platforms to collect data. We can better improve the measurements from satellites, improve models that helps uh, us in predicting uh, or understanding processes that drive uh, life within the ocean. So in this example, and I have um, the device here, uh, I don't know if you can see it, this yellow device, it's about, let's say 12 centimeters long. Um, and you can see it in the image. It's, you attach this to, a, to an efficient net. Now, when you have this, um, there is also a deck unit that goes with it. So the deck unit collects uh, GPS uh, positions, um, which you can merge with the measurements uh, from uh, the sensor that is attached to the, to the net. It starts collecting data the moment it, it touches water, and you would be able to understand the, the, the physical environment within which the fish lives. Um, this is a collaboration with Ocean Data Network. Um, they have provided a bit, uh, with uh, they have provided a few of these sensors that we are trying out within the region and see how it, it can help us improve uh, in situ measurements. So the good thing about this is that uh, on your, on my right we can know where fishermen had gone to fish. For every tour that they go to, they, for every fishing expedition, we are able to look at uh, where they had fished. We understand their behavior. We can now look at the in situ measurements and understand stuff like upwelling, uh, the mixed layer depth, and how the, even the net behaves uh, within the water. Uh, again, by looking at this profile, we will know within which depth certain fishes are caught. Because when you when the net is deployed, it, it catches a fish. 
when you come back to shore, you can sort them out and identify the species. So we know which depth uh, uh, certain species of fish thrive and understanding this is very, very useful for, for fisheries management. So it's also not just about using satellite data for fisheries management. We, as part of our mandate, we help in training. Again, we have a strat strategy in building capacity in various areas in uh, satellite data processing uh, and visualization and generating products. Uh, we, we, at every point in time, work together with countries to ensure that there is proper uh, uptake of EU products and services for better decision making. And we are also very much open to collaboration in terms of training, uh, deploying uh, centers for for validating some of the products that we generate. So in short, this is what we do at the University of Ghana with, together with our partners in ensuring that our ocean remains safe, our ocean remains productive for our, our own good. Thank you very much for having me. And if you want to uh, reach out to us or know what we do, you can visit any of some of these uh, handles that we have here. Thanks so much. Over to you, Paula. You're muted, please. Okay, not anymore. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kimame. So I, I need to say that I'm astonished with the amount of services, nice services that the Marco Marconva project uh, is developed in North and uh, in West Africa. Uh, I need to highlight here the, the very good example of how to take science outside of the research and academic bubble in a very easy and comprehensive and let's say fisherman friendly way like helping them uh, in this rescue and the safety and rescue in the sea. So I think this is an amazing example as well. And also this is in situ sensors attaching the fisheries net to, to understand a little bit more the, the fisheries and uh, improve fisheries management in this region. So thank you very much. I think you're gonna have a lot of questions as well. And then we have our last participant of today. Uh, let's just me see if everything is ready for him. Uh, he's in Algeria. And then you have Bohali Mohamed Amin uh, from the University of Science and Technology in Technology, Hawari Biomedien in Algeria. Thank you, Bohali, for coming uh, and giving just giving this presentation for us. So we can start. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for accepting my communication in Ocean Best Practice Workshop. I start my presentation, which is entitled Oceanography Operational Satellite Data Computing Technology Vision, a tool for observing and monitoring oceanic system. The outline of the presentation is as follows. I start with an introduction by the following operational oceanography satellite observation and monitoring basic of remote sensing and electromagnetic radiation, some definition of digital modeling a model digital modeling tools, advanced observation platforms and ocean data record, processing software, numerical simulation by video mapping of oceanic time series data. In conclusion, we will see some application of multidimensional simulation of satellite data by video mapping of the Western Mediterranean Sea. Remote sensing, electronic map, high-speed computing, and broadband communication technology have created new ability to examine planet Earth like never before. This advance made it possible to begin the study of the Earth as a total entity. The Earth function as complex system where diverse classes of physical, chemical, and biological nature are interlinked on very different spatial and temporal scale. With the fast development of remote sensing technology, Earth observation can be progressively carried out all day long and in all weather conditions. Operational ocean forecasting system coordinate observation and modeling system and have been widely recognized as an important asset in monitoring the state of the ocean, thus addressing current challenge in increasing our understanding of the ocean. 
Instrument technology development has occurred alongside advanced in information system technology, capable of handling the growing volume of data and computational overhead. Integration of data simulation and model represent a key element in providing accurate assessment of ocean condition over a wide range of spatial and temporal scale. Operational oceanography integrates remote observation, in situ measurement, and modeling system, constitute a powerful tool to monitor, analyze, and predict the state of marine resources, as well as the sustainable development of coastal area, so as to provide continuous forecast of the future condition of the sea as far ahead as possible. Provide a description of the present state of the sea, including living resources with optimal accuracy. Assemble long term climatic data set to describe past state and time series showing trend and change. Operational oceanographic activity used advanced tools and platforms using the last technological development in measurement and communication to be more, more cost effective. Most of such activity are undertaken by autonomous tools, the possibility to observe various ocean parameters and classes by existing satellite sensor. The basic parameters are the surface temperature observed by infrared radiometer, ocean color by spectrometer, sea surface vision by altimeter, and surface redness by active and passive microwave system. The electromagnetic EM spectrum represents the distribution of electromagnetic waves according to their wavelength, their frequency, or even their energy. The underlying basis for most remote sensing method and system is simply that of measuring the varying energy and or frequency level of a single entity, the fundamental unit in the EM force file. Digital modeling is a mathematical scientific practice that really on both principle and method that can be applied to construct a model. A model is a description or analogy used to help visualize something that cannot be directly observed. A system of postular data and inference presented as a mathematical description of an entity or state of affairs. Digital modeling tools exploit the basis of scientific knowledge in the data processing system by using mathematical and statistical tools and analysis and forecasting methods to visualize what is hidden behind the data, which cannot be observed directly. Integration of data assimilation and model represent a key element in providing accurate Assessment of ocean condition over a wide range of spatial and temporal scale. Data assimilation is a well developed practice in atmospheric science and in physical oceanography, whereas it remains a challenge in geochemical ocean modeling. Satellite and model data are stored in a number of formats, such as HDF. HDF EOS and NetCDF. It's extremely useful to serve vast volume of diverse data from a single server to improve data coverage, both in time and in space, allow the successful implementation of ocean data assimilation platforms. Over the recent years, new geochemical variables were progressively added to the global ocean observing system. Erdap by NOAA and Copernicus Marine Service, UKU and Mercator Ocean International and the State of the Ocean by NASA is a data server that gives you a simple, consistent way to download subsets and, uh, of scientific data set in common files. Mercator Ocean has developed a complex ocean simulation system, numerical models, Based on ocean observation data, satellite and in situ that are able to describe, analyze, and predict the physical state and view geochemistry. State of the Ocean by NASA is a suite of tools presented through an interactive web-based visualization front end. 
which provide access to a broad range of satellite viewing products with key parameter of interest to the oceanographic community. Based on computer science and cartography theory, digital cartography is a theory and technique for studying and solving the problem of acquisition, transformation, storage, management, and graphic output of cartographic spatial data. The task of digital cartography is to use digital technology to implement map making and production and to provide basic geographic information for geographic information system. Because what utility are designed to process and transform satellite data in useful way for data producer and user. The user work with Earth science data created by NOAA, Coastwatch and OceanWatch. User can easily view and convert data in various formats, HDF and NetCDF. The software has both interactive and bot processing tools. CDAG and Panoplay by NASA is a comprehensive software package for processing, display, analysis, and quality control of remote sensing Earth data. CDAG can read the file in generic format and perform basic image related operations such as visualization, cramping, masking, geographic mapping, file aggregation, bond creation using mathematical equations bond filtering and statistical analysis. In terms of technique and method, with application of computer technology, artificial intelligence technology, data mining, knowledge discovery technology, and so on in the discipline of cartography and map design, how to use data mining and knowledge discovery technology to construct a new map expression, content, system, and form, a knowledge map, spatial information visualization, and vertical geographic environment technology is a new and growing part of cartography. Visualization is a kind of spatial cognition behavior, will providing insight into the complex process of spatial data analysis and displaying the multidimensional and multi-temporal data and process. Visualization can effectively improve and enhance the capacity of geographical environment information transmission and help in understanding and finding the relationship between natural phenomena. Time series data set maintain the value of certain variables as a function of time in the geospatial domain, such as such data set are used to store measurement for many natural events at different points along the timeline. In conclusion, I want to thank the oceanographic community for this implementation of the Global Ocean Observation System and Ocean Forecasting System. And we will see some application of multidimensional simulation of satellite data by video mapping of the Western Mediterranean Sea, Algerian coast. Each variation of variable is in synchronization with other variation of several variables. Video mapping ocean simulation make it possible to observe several variables on the same time arcs and to follow the evolution of single variable over time with the simulation that brings together several years of evolution of this variable on the same axis of, of temporal simulation. We can observe the variation of the variable sea surface temperature at the same time with the variation of the many other variables chlorophyll, current, salinity, which are in fact linked together by link of physical force or chemical or trophic relationship when dealing with biodiversity and biomass as a variable. Through the development of measuring instrument and calculator and processing software, we seek to explain the functioning of ocean through the use of mathematical and statistical tools on a scientific basis, the links that exist between the different variables and which variables are based on the variation 
in other variables and this repercussion on the functioning of marine ecosystem in general and the food web in particular. Thank you. I muted, I was muted. So thank you, Bohali, for your presentation. I think at the beginning was a, in, an incredible lecture about uh, ocean observing systems and the nice examples you have you gave us here and how to integrate these platforms to downscaling the the data for uh, the 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 coast, the north coast of uh, Africa. So I have four questions here, not four questions, is is three questions. So I can ask the speakers to put the camera on again, so you can be with me here. Uh, I think you only have Johanna Ikiva Mesa now. Uh, so the first question from Jay is to Joaquin, but unfortunately uh, Joaquin uh, left. Uh, he has another appointment, and then we can pass this question for him to answer directly to you, Jay. Jay has another question to Johanna, and Johanna has another question from Virginia as well. So the first question uh, is uh, for Johanna, for uh, sea surface temperature, do you have standards or best practice relating to the data and anal analysis of sea surface temperature? This is the first one about the best practice. And the other one is you mentioned about the need to focus on new techniques in coastal and upwelling regions. But could you provide an example of those new techniques you are referring to? Or what type of new techniques you can have in these regions? So can you answer, Johanna? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sure. put the questions for us. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for the questions. And I will take uh, Jay's question first about standards and best practices. And uh, Jay, actually, uh, the role of the GRIST team is um, one of the roles of the team is actually to establish standards and best practices relating to the SST data and analysis. So I invite you to have a look at the GRIST website. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with it. There's a few pages related to SST users with information about different types of products and uh, also information about uh, what types of validation uh, we do or it's being done actually, so that they can give an overview of um, what kind of um, systematic biases or standard deviations one you uh, could expect. And that means that uh, similarly, a user can follow these types of metrics for their own analysis as well. Um, and it also gives uh, some information about uh, the different products and quality levels that are used uh, in the products and how can users understand these quality levels. So if, if you would uh, download a level four SST product and a level four SST product is essentially collected information from different sensors and uh, quality controlled and then optimally interpolated to fill in the gaps because of uh, bad data or clouds or missing data. Uh, each point comes with an uncertainty estimate and a quality uh, estimate. And it's up to the user to um, select what is the, so for example, quality goes from a bad, and we advise against using that, to best quality. And it can be anything to bad, uh, bad retrieval, uh, accepted quality, overall okay quality, good quality. So it's up to the user to, um, let's say, decide what kind of analysis they want to do. But uh, of course, the GRIST uh, group provides some uh, information about uh, best practices. I don't know if that answers par partially the question, but uh, you're welcome to uh, elaborate more. Um, should I go to the next question then, yes. Paula? Yeah, yeah. I just uh, just mentioned here that I put the link of the, the group here, the group Perfect. here in the chat, so people can go inside and, and look into the information you just gave us now. Perfect, thank you so much. And then uh, for uh, Virginie, if I pronounce the name uh, correctly, 
Um, so as I mentioned, uh, in uh, coastal and upwelling regions, um, there, there's a big challenge related to the retrieval of the sea surface temperature, but also on identifying um, what part could be uh, real water, uh, cold water, for example, upwelling, or what it what it is, for example, a cloud. So cloud masking algorithms also have uh, challenges in the coastal regions. So some of the techniques related to actually um, investigating is uh, machine learning. Artificial, artificial intelligence uh, algorithms are now becoming uh, kind of a hot topic uh, also uh, in, co in, in connection with the traditional retrieval algorithms. So this is one example. Another example is improving, uh, utilizing techniques to improve identifying what is cloud, uh, uh, then cold, but we need to filter it out, or what is actually water, and it's a cold water pixel, and we need to maintain it. Uh, also, the, it has to do with tec better techniques on improving the resolution of the SST, so the instrument itself. So it, it, it touches uh, many different uh, parts related to all the issues that pose challenges in the coastal regions. And that's the instruments themselves, the natural processes themselves, how we retrieve SST, even availability of in-situ data for actually assessing the SST retrievals. So it's a, it's a whole uh, big topic. Thank you, Johanna. And you think there are more, there are projects that is already looking into this, into these new techniques, and to discover how to ultrapass these challenges? Yeah, yeah, to... there are. Yeah, there are projects uh, that uh, deal with that. So we, in the Greece community, because as I said, it's uh, an international community. All of our members are uh, located in some uh, institute, either academic institute either research institute, uh, some of them are located in some space agencies, they are the ones that actually manage and produce the data. So and this is the nice part of the GRIS team that it comprises of, uh, of um, researchers at uh, various uh, different uh, parts of the whole process, from the data producers to the actual uh, users as well. And uh, there are projects that are trying to improve or elaborate on, on how the um, SST can be better retrieved on the coastal zone. But obviously, it's also very important for us as a science team to have feedback from SST uh, data users, uh, like WAME, for example, and uh, any other user of that gets satellite data and uses them for their own purpose. It's important for them to, re to report back to us uh, with challenges uh, in their specific applications and in their specific uh, areas. So we can always uh, be motivated to look into more issues, but also it's a kind of a feedback mechanism. Also maybe provide our support for our users to look for funding to actually uh, solve some of these problems themselves. So it's a, it's a support system. Okay, it's an open uh, group that it's you know, looking to this. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Uh, I, I have one here, it's just a request for you. Uh, this, please, can you send us the uh, sister face server addresses? But I think it, I put the website here. I don't know if this... Yeah. The, yeah. Uh, one important thing to keep in mind is that the GRIST uh, website that you shared, Paula, is uh, uh, nobody can get data from there because the GRIST uh, team does not uh, distribute data. Uh, we are establishing the standards and the formats uh, that um, allow for the data producers to make uh, data sets in a similar format. But uh, and we also host information about where users can actually access the data. Uh, but uh, an obvious choice, for example, as Kwame mentioned, is the Copernicus Marine Service. Uh, it's the physical oceanography, uh, it's PODAC uh, from the US. So Greece itself does not produce the data. So it's important to keep that in mind. Okay. And but people can find uh, platforms where they can look for the data there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I don't have more questions here. I don't know if we have questions from the, the YouTube. I have one personally from uh, Kivame that uh, I'm just curious to know about the challenges of the project. The project is a very big project and then you are working with two 
two stakeholders that are very, very, very challengeable ones. One is the government that sometimes is very hard to put them together and in one single goal, or in your case, in several goals and put them to discuss this and, and see the importance of the work. And one, one of the questions is about how uh, is the challenge to put these this people together. Another one is about the fishermen, that the other type of stakeholders that we need to build a trust process in, in, in to be able to include or to work with them in a more interactive way or a participatory way, let's say. So my, my, my questions for you, if you have had challenges about that in, in developing, in implementing the system with the government and also with the fishermen. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you for that question. And strangely, it's been easier working with the fishermen. And, mm. and the, the answer is this, and the reason is this. Um, when you have a solution co-designed, it becomes easier for for it to be taken up. So that has that has that has that is what has worked with us with the fishermen, um, right from designing the idea and 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 building the solutions. We've always been in touch with them. So uh, it became obvious one. I mean, they can't speak English or they may not be able to read. They, through our interaction, we realized we can still communicate this with you because in the past, that is what that is what they use to sort of relay information among themselves using flags and colors. So that is how it had worked with, 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 with the fishermen. Uh, with regards to government, it has been a bit challenging and it continues to be challenging, but but I mean, we have we have decided to keep doing this and to constantly engage. Again, with with uh, governments, you know, they have there are a lot of varying interests from country to country. So it's sort of at some point you need to have a targeted solution and a targeted approach, and and sometimes it works. So that is that is how we have gotten around these these sort of challenges. But but um, Paula, I think it's important I make this clear. I slowly uh, EO uptake in Africa. It's 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 taking it's taking shape and um, I know with time uh, a lot of people would would be able to process satellite imagery, see an image and be able to interpret it and and find ways to use them in in their day to day activities. Yes, thank you. Very good, thank you, Kevin. I think now this uh, uh, bottom up approach of the fishermen is always is is always uh, um, showing us that works much better than just giving them a solution that was not made for them. I have another question for you uh, here, just appear for me. And then the, the, the question is, what activities in capacity development do you have in your program, in your project? Okay, so um, it varies from, from basic, I mean, I mean, basic remote sensing to um, uh, data handling and processing using Python and MATLAB, R, and so forth, and and now developing applications. So um, what we also do is we sometimes do targeted training where we would identify or we would we would have a request from an entity to host or to provide some training for an individual who is. Uh, interested in EO applications and service development. So um, it varies. Um, we also have um, the African Union uh, distance learning platform where it's not just us at, at the University of Ghana and our consortium. There are other uh, partners also developing things around land systems and so forth. So there are tons of um, training materials that one can find from a distance learning platform hosted by the African Union where capacity building can 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 be sought so um it's 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 the point i'm trying to make is that anyone who has a challenge you reach out to us uh, if we don't have the capacity to help build build you up we have a colleague or an entity that we can connect you to yes very nice to know that so people just uh, pay attention to this uh, uh, all these capacity buildings and training courses that you have there so I don't have another question now. Uh, so I would like to thank you, Johanna, Kivame, and also Joaquin, and also our last speaker that I just forgot the name, I'm sorry, but you remember now, Bohali. So thank you, Bohali, as well, from Algeria to be with us today. Uh, I think we shared all the solution activities and how we are uh, let's say, uh, improving the ocean observing system to tackle this challenge, this ocean decade uh, challenges that is to 
improve this observing system to ensure that we will be safe. The economic is more, let's say, uh, uh, more predictive, and then the uh, the ecosystem, the ocean ecosystems are health as well. Uh, I got another one here, just. Uh, so uh, just a last question for you, uh, that is what fisheries they use the uh, EO data for? What fisheries use the EO data for? They Hello? share their own data? Um, oh, um, not, not, not directly, but that's one of the things I, and I showed an example where we are now, we now want to put um, sensors on their nets, right? That is that is one way you can collect data from from them. Uh, most of the time, uh, information on or data on catch that comes from them um, will not be too accurate because they one they can't identify fishes properly, you know. So you need a, a, a technical person to be with them to be doing that. And I don't think we can have a technical person at every landing spot to be able to do that. But but the point for me and what is important is the sort of co cooperation we get from from them. Um, and it's it's also the onus is also on us to demystify science and earth observation and all of that so that they can relate to it because that is that is how we would get this sort of uh buying and the and the understanding to be able to work properly with them so that that is for me that that's something i really want to count on um it's it's getting certain information from them could be difficult but they are very very open and collaborative yeah thank you so thank you very much. So I can close the session now. So thank you everyone who has been with us one hour and a half here. So good morning, who I still not had lunch yet and good the rest of, good afternoon for the rest of the day for the others. So thank you very much and enjoy the next session. <laughs>